In the last video, we saw that conjugation is the key to color. In this video, we're going to look at a few famous organic chemistry molecules that have color. One of the most famous is the color of mauve, which is this purplish color over here on the right. And over here on the left is the dot structure for the major molecule responsible for the color of mauve. Mauve was first synthesized by an 18-year-old named William Henry Perkin, who was on holiday from his chemistry studies when he decided to try to synthesize uh, quinine, also pronounced quinine, which is a cure for malaria. And Perkin decided to try to synthesize uh, quinine using chemicals that he had isolated from coal tar. And at that time in, in chemistry, chemists knew the molecular formulas of compounds, but they didn't know how the atoms connected. They didn't know what the dot structure looked like. So Perkin Perkin knew that the molecular formula of quinine was C20H24N2O2. So he reasoned that if he took a molecule that he found in coal tar, which had the molecular formula of C10H13N, and he was able to oxidize two of those molecules somehow, he might be able to produce the quinine molecule. And so he tried this uh, using the molecule that he isolated from coal tar, and he used potassium dichromate. And he didn't produce quinine, but he did produce a reddish powder, which didn't really do anything, but Perkin decided to repeat the experiment using some aniline that he had also isolated from coal tar. And the aniline was contaminated with some other molecules from coal tar. And it turned out when he oxidized uh, those molecules with potassium dichromate, he made uh, a purple solution, which he uh, tried uh, to dye some silk with, and it turned out to be a very nice dye. Perkin thought he'd made a very important discovery, and so he sent out some inquiries to people who owned dye companies. And uh, one of them in particular told him that this could be a very, very valuable dye. So Perkin decided to quit school and to become an industrial chemist and to try to synthesize mauve on a large scale. And when Queen Victoria wore a mauve dress to her daughter's wedding, everyone wanted mauve. And so mauve became a massive success and Perkin became a very wealthy man. And this created a, a large demand for new colors. And so more chemists came along and tried to synthesize uh, synthetic organic chemistry molecules that had color uh, using coal tar and, and they were successful. So many Many, many more colors were developed over, over the next few years, which showed businessmen that organic chemistry could be a very profitable business. And so this really paved the way for the development of pharmaceutical companies in the, in the late 19th century, which of course have grown into the modern pharmaceutical industry today, which creates all kinds of life-saving drugs. And so mauve is the molecule that started it all, and so that's why it is so famous. Um, Sir William Henry Perkin was able to retire in his mid-30s, a very wealthy man, and he spent uh, the, the, the rest of his life um, doing, doing chemistry for fun, essentially, and even has a reaction named after him. So the history of mauve is, uh, is, is, is very, very interesting. Let's look at um, another molecule. Uh, which is also famous. So this is indigo. And in modern times, of course, indigo is famous for being the color of blue jeans. And indigo is, uh, indigo is actually a dye that's, that's uh, from a plant that's been known about for thousands of years. And so for thousands of years, indigo was extracted from this plant and used for various purposes. In the 19th century, indigo was first produced synthetically. And, and if you look at the dot structure for indigo, you can see that all of the carbons, all of the carbons in, in indigo are sp2 hybridized. So they all have p orbitals. And so there is some extensive conjugation throughout the indigo molecule. But as we saw in the last video, if you're if you're going to produce a color that's that's blue or indigo, you would have to you would have to absorb light that has a long wavelength, and so you would need extensive conjugation, much more than than is a than is apparent uh, in the indigo molecule. And so there must be something else that gives indigo its color, and that has to do with non-bonding electrons. And so, for example, this nitrogen over here on the left has a pair of non-bonding electrons. In the last video we saw that the key to color is decreasing the distance between the two molecular orbitals, the bonding and the anti-bonding molecular orbitals. So if this is my bonding molecular orbital and this is my anti-bonding molecular orbital, in the last video the goal was to decrease the distance between the bonding and the anti-bonding molecular orbital, or decrease the energy I should say, and the more you, the more you decrease the energy difference between those, the longer the wavelength of light that's absorbed. And the longer the wavelength of light that's absorbed, if you think about something giving you a color of indigo, it would have to, it would have to um, absorb in somewhere in the yellow or orange region in order for it to reflect indigo or blue. 
And so it would have to absorb uh, something that has a long wavelength. And so the explanation for, uh, for color in indigo uh, deals with the non-bonding electrons that you find in that molecule. And non-bonding electrons are actually a at a higher energy level than the bonding molecular orbital. And so that is a smaller energy difference between the non-bonding orbital and the anti-bonding molecular orbital. And of course, that smaller energy difference uh, uh, um, correlates with a longer wavelength absorbed. You're able to absorb in the yellow or, or orange region, and therefore you're able to reflect in the blue or indigo. And that is what gives it its color. So, so conjugation uh, sometimes is, is more complicated than just looking at alternating single and double bonds. Let's look at, um, let's look at another famous molecule here. And uh, this is phenolphthalein, right, which is uh, probably the most famous acid-base indicator. And over here on the left, you can see the structure of phenolphthalein at a low pH, right? It is colorless. And uh, we, can, we can analyze the dot structure a little bit. These, these benzene rings that are present in phenolphthalein are conjugated. But if you look at this carbon right here in the center, right, that's an sp3 hybridized carbon with no p orbitals. And so the conjugation is broken up at this carbon in the center. And so you have only a small amount of conjugation presence in phenolphthalein at a low pH. And so that's why um, it does not absorb in the visible spectrum, and that's why it's colorless. But we know that phenolphthalein is an acid-base indicator, meaning it's going to change color at a different pH. And so if you add some base to it, um, if you add some base to it, then you're, gonna, you're going to increase the pH to a high pH, and then we see that it changes to a red-purple color. And so if we, uh, if we think about why, we can, we can think about adding a base to phenolphthalein. So we can have a hydroxide anion right here. So if I go ahead and draw in a, a negatively charged hydroxide anion like that, it's going to function as a base. One of these lone pairs of electrons right, is going to pick up that proton. This oxygen had two lone pairs of electrons on it like that. And so when the base takes this proton, these two electrons are left behind on that oxygen. And so now we have three lone pairs of electrons on that oxygen. right? So now it is negatively charged like that. And so if we think about what the electrons might do, uh, these, electrons, these electrons could move into here. Uh, which would mean too many bonds to this carbon. So, so these electrons in here are pushed off over here. These electrons would be pushed off onto here. And then, again, that's too many bonds to this carbon right here. So these electrons are going to kick off onto that oxygen. So the end result would be to form this molecule over here on the right. And so there's a negative charge on this oxygen. And this other proton would, of course, be taken off in a basic environment. And so this is now negatively charged. And notice what this reaction does. It now conjugates the entire molecule. If we focus in on that center carbon, this carbon is now sp2 hybridized, which means that it has a p orbital. And we can now delocalize those electrons, right? So we now have a conjugation throughout the entire molecule. We have alternating single double bonds throughout the entire molecule. So you can see double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond. And so now, uh, now since, you're, since you're more conjugated, you're able to absorb in the visible spectrum. And therefore, you're able to reflect in the visible spectrum. And you're able to see a red and purple color associated with this molecule. And so, of course, this reaction is reversible, right? If you add acid, it goes back to the colorless state. So you can, you can change the color uh, of molecules using chemical reactions. Uh, another cool example of, of color changing uh, molecules would be something called photochromic crystals. So photochromic refers to the fact that they change color in the sunlight. And so uh, what, what, whatever kind of reaction it is, a molecule can, can change its conjugation when exposed to the sun and therefore change color. And then when you put it in the dark, it'll actually revert back to the original color. And then you could put it in the sun and it'll change color again. And so photochromic crystals, uh, extremely cool uh, lab to do and uh, they have they also have some some practical uses as well so that's another cool color changing reaction for our last example uh, let's let's uh, let let's think about bleach all right so let's, let's let's think about stains on your clothes okay so if you have some sort of a colored stain on your clothes let's say it's a large conjugated molecule like this and so I'm just going to pretend like it's much larger than that so this is a very small portion of a large conjugated molecule that has color and so it's a stain 
And so one way to remove that stain would be to add some bleach here. So if we're going to add some bleach, uh, different bleaches react in different ways, but essentially what they're going to do is react with one of those double bonds. I'm going to pick the double bond in the center there. And so I'm just going to redraw this molecule really fast here. And I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and put in my double bonds, right? So there's a double bond right here, and there's a double bond right here. I'm going to say the bleach reacts to the double bond in the middle. And so, uh, once again, different bleaches can do different things. Um, it can oxidize or reduce this bond, but let's let's say it's going to add two atoms across that double bond. And I'll put an X here since, since we don't really know what kind of bleach we're dealing with. So it puts two atoms across that double bond, and that disrupts the conjugation, right? Now you no longer have alternating single double bonds. And so you take away the color of the stain. The molecule is actually still there. You just can't see it because now the molecule is absorbing in the UV region. So that's just a, a, a quick a quick overview of some famous molecules and some famous applications of color. And, and I happen to think color is is one of the color in organic chemistry is one of the most interesting topics.